If you love the great outdoors, Glacier National Park has got to be on your bucket list. With over 700 miles of trails and spectacular views, it's no wonder it's called the Hikers National Park. Located in the northwest corner of Montana, Glacier is for the adventurous who want to explore the wilderness on foot, by boat, or even on horseback. This 2021 update includes new footage, as well as tips on how to deal with the issue of overcrowding and the park's new reservation ticket system, which is designed to reduce it. It took me over 30 days to shoot this update. I wanted to make sure that it remains the most comprehensive video on the park. Record attendance over the last few years has brought traffic and parking issues to the park. And in-park rooms must be booked several months or even a year in advance. So for the first time, I'll talk about staying outside the park. But don't come here for the accommodations. Come for the amazing trails, the wildlife, and the incredible scenery. And of course, to hike to one of the remaining glaciers or on the Continental Divide Trail. I'll do my best to provide tips to you photographers so that you can capture some of this amazing scenery and wildlife and the dramatic greens, reds, and blues. On a personal note, Glacier is my favorite park, and I've been to most of them. I've gone to Glacier most years since 1994, and I've been making park videos ever since. I've seen some changes, but most of the trail views are pretty much the same but fire has rebooted the life cycle in places. And on my first trip to the park, there were 27 glaciers. Then we were down to 25, but the latest survey says that we've gained one back. There are now 26 classified glaciers in the park. I'm gonna take you to one of them. This guide has always been the most comprehensive video on Glacier National Park. And like the others, this one will help you explore the Sun Road to cruise or paddle its lakes, and of course to hike the trails that make Glacier the Hikers National Park. I'm going to take you step by step on many of the most popular trails in the park. And the passes here, well they top out at just 67 to 7200 feet, so it takes little time to acclimatize to hiking in Glacier. But there are also flat trails, and some of these are just as spectacular as the high ones. I'll take you on long trails and short ones, past waterfalls, and through incredible valleys. But first, I want to introduce this massive park's five main areas that you're going to want to visit. The red boxes represent each of the five areas in Glacier National Park. And yes, there are six because Glacier has a sister park in Canada. The Park Service website created a trail map for each of these five areas. On the map itself, the trails are listed at the top of each map, along with the net elevation gain. So first, here's a brief overview of each area. Let's start with the Lake McDonald area. This is where most people enter the park, and it can be a bit crowded. The base elevation here is the lowest in the park, and most trails are well below the 6,000 to 6,900 foot tree line. So they're shaded, which is handy on hot days. The mini glacier map covers trails in the northeast part of the park, which is my favorite. There are flat trails with great views, strenuous hikes with great views, and my favorite trail, which ends at a glacier. The North Fork and Goat Haunt map extend to the Canadian border. The North Fork area has many remote finger lakes, which are accessed via rough gravel roads. Goat Haunt can only be accessed from a trail or through Canada. The St. Mary map includes trails along the east side of the Sun Road and Logan Pass. Here you'll find easy access to waterfalls near the Sun Road, hikes to high mountain passes, and popular trails at Logan Pass. Two Medicine is in the southeast part of the park. From the time the park opened in 1910 until the going to the Sun Road was completed in 1932, most park visitors arrived by train in the nearby town of East Glacier. Today, Two Medicine is less crowded than the other areas of the park, which is kind of odd because it has some amazing trails. Glacier Sister Park, Canada's Waterton Lakes, is another area worth visiting. It's the home of the Prince of Wales Hotel and the awesome but very difficult Crypt Lake Trail. There's only one road that crosses Glacier National Park, the fabulous 50-mile Going to the Sun Road. 
Several trails can be accessed from it, and that's where we're going to begin. And no, you don't need a car to drive it. You can book a red bus tour several months in advance. And now we hikers can get reservations on the hiker shuttle, though there still may be significant wait times. We begin our 50-mile journey on the east side, near St. Mary. And if this is your first time, be sure to stop at the Visitor Center. The east side is much drier than the west, and about 1,200 feet higher, at almost 4,500 feet. So there are fewer trees to block the glacier-carved scenery. As we drive west, the road is sandwiched between Two Dog Flats on your right and St. Mary's Lake on the left. A sign on one of the first turnouts points to a very unique mountain. The waters from this small minor peak flow to three different oceans, the Pacific, the Atlantic, and the Arctic. The power of ice is plain to see above Two Dog Flats. This is the first of many geological features that I'll point out along the route. Millions of years ago, this land was under the sea. Sediment layers build up over eons. Some of the rock in the park is over one billion years old. More recently, several ice ages have come and gone. The last really big glaciers receded 10 to 12,000 years ago. This relatively flat section is excellent wildlife habitat. Shortly after sunrise, large herds of elk come down from the mountains and head towards the lake. Bears and other predators also like to drink from the lake in the morning. Never approach a bear. And don't even think about getting out of your car. It's much safer to see them from the window. At the western edge of the flats is one of my favorite places to stay in the park, Rising Sun. Unfortunately, in 2020, it was closed, along with other park lodging on the east side, due to COVID. This side of the park is adjacent to the Blackfeet Nation. In fact, this side of the park was leased to the U.S. by the Blackfeet under a treaty that allowed for the formation of the park in 1910. To protect their settlements and their people, the Blackfeet restricted travel across the reservation to all. Thankfully, all of the park, including my favorite side, is open once again. By the way, the full length of the road doesn't usually open until mid to late June. And July openings are not uncommon because of the massive effort required to clear all the snow and weather tends to close the road by mid-October. In 2020, the east entrance, well, it never opened. This gate, west of Rising Sun, was as far east as you could go. From the west, it can take two to three hours to get here. Luckily, there's a parking and rest area with a bathroom on the lakeside. The picnic area is nicely surrounded by trees. A short path leads to St. Mary Lake. This sign warns that a mountain lion has recently been seen in the area, so you need to be alert. The narrow beach is a nice place to take in the pleasant view, especially early in the morning. And if you're really lucky, you might even spot one of the smaller mammals in the park, like this alpine chipmunk. A little further up the road, there's a parking area for the St. Mary Boat Dock. I've taken this tour at sunset, and it's a good way to close the day. Just around the bend is one of the most photographed locations in Glacier National Park, the Wild Goose Island viewpoint. This is one of my favorite views in the park. I've been here a hundred times, and it's always different and beautiful. The view changes throughout the day. At daybreak, it's dramatic. At mid-morning, the mountains are bright, and it's serene. In the afternoon, convection creates pretty clouds, and at sundown, it's almost spiritual. Perhaps even more so late in the season, when smoke, hopefully from distant fires, blurs the landscape. Fire is an important part of the forest life cycle. It's necessary for rebirth. In 2017, a small fire, by park standards, burned the mature forest around this section of the road. Even trees in Wild Goose Island were burned. The next section of road climbs to an overlook with parking above St. Mary Lake. It's a nice viewpoint. 
And yes, that's Wild Goose Island. Again, the view can be quite different depending on the time of day and the weather. Usually it's rather windy. In the afternoon, the clouds can be rather interesting. And one day, there was a rainbow. On one rare, calm day, there was a duck that had the whole lake to himself. And if you're a rock hound, the opposite cliff face is interesting too. 2020 was my first fall trip to Glacier, and it won't be my last, because the color in early October was really nice. Driving through a burn area will elicit, well, mixed feelings. Dead trees aren't as pretty as a lush forest, but fire is natural and necessary. This one also made it easier to see the distant mountains. In a few places, it also revealed what was hidden. This is Lost Lake. It's just above the road, but the thick trees blocked it from view. So I had never seen it before. Turns out this is the home for a rare snail that only lives in this lake. The nearby Sun Point parking area is another handy place to get out of the car, explore a bit, and maybe even grab a bite to eat on a picnic table with a warning that, well, you don't see at many picnic spots. And it turns out that this warning was valid. While waiting to use the pit toilet, we saw a black bear mama and her two cubs feeding on the hill. Luckily, they were more interested in the berries than us. There's also a trailhead here leading to three waterfalls. The first is just two-thirds of a mile away. The trail is mostly flat with nice views of St. Mary Lake. It also offers a chance to walk through a burn area, which it turns out has many nice photo ops. In Bering Falls, well, it's not bad either. And on a hot day, the mist may help you keep cool. You can continue for another mile or so to two more waterfalls. This is a nice trail to get a little exercise on a day when you're likely to spend a lot of time on the road. As the road continues to the burn area, I was intrigued by a sidetrack with its gate down. It turns out it leads to the remains of one of the park's historic cabins. Back in the day, this was a shelter for backcountry rangers. Today, it's a relic of the past that will hopefully be respected and left undisturbed. A few miles later is the popular Sun Rift Gorge. This small gorge is just a few steps above the road. But most stop here because this is the shortest way to Bering Falls. It's just a third of a mile from here. Those looking for more exercise can head further down the trail to St. Mary Falls and even all the way to Virginia Falls. And because of that, this parking area often fills up early. If these falls are on your must-do list, you really need to get here early. More mountains come into view as the road continues through the burn area. We're also approaching one billion year old red rock. Here's another one of those things that's a little bit hard to believe. But when the silt and mud that formed these rocks was laid down, this area was the west coast of the continent. Yep, there was a time when there was no land west of here. But I'll talk more about that in the geology segment. This is the St. Mary Falls Trailhead parking area. This trail bypasses Bering Falls. And yes, as you can tell, there are many trails in this area and getting back to the correct parking lot can be an issue. So make sure you read the trail signs. I once ended up at the wrong parking area. I've been to this place many times too. And prior to the fire, the forest was so dense you could barely see St. Mary Lake. Of course, in 2017, things changed. The old went away and the life cycle restarted allowing the sun to reach the forest floor, sprouting new life in young plants, a new food source. Behind those trees is a shy female moose feeding on that new growth. And sorry, but here's one more science lesson before we leave this place. Look down. Many of the red rocks have fossilized ripples on them. Others have mud cracks. And one reason they're so well-preserved? Well, they're so old that complex life had yet to evolve. 
The road cuts through even more colorful geology as it rises. In places, it's a more typical dull gray or pale yellow. But then a few miles away, it's bright green. And after that, a deep red. Near the pass, it cuts through the black band. The reason for the diversity is fascinating and explained well in roadside geology books available in the gift shop. Even if you don't need the bathroom, this pullout has great views of the mountains. The road climbs out of the burn area towards the Alpine section. It begins at the Jackson Glacier Overlook. And when the weather gets bad, this is the point at which they close the road. This is the best place along the road to see one of the park's glaciers. Jackson is the largest glacier in the park, but this one, like all the others in the park, has shrunk over the decades. In 1997, I hiked up to Grinnell Glacier with Al Gore. I was also there when the U.S. Geological Survey inspected Grinnell Glacier 10 or so years later. Soon after that, the park's info sign started stating that all the glaciers in the park will disappear by the year 2020. This new one was installed in 2019, and it has no such claim. When I wrote the last version of this video, there were only 25 glaciers in the park. Today, the park claims there are 26. I shot this video in 2010. The glaciers have been melting for a very long time, since the Little Ice Age ended in the mid-1800s. But it's more noticeable now. This is the glacier in 2020. If you want to see it up close, there's a trailhead at the end of the parking lot. The heavily used 15.4 mile trail to the glacier begins here. It climbs over 2,400 feet, so you need to be in shape. I decided to go only as far as Gunsight Lake. This section of the road is well out of the burn area. The road is about to get twisty, so if you're a slow driver and there are cars behind you, be nice and use one of the pullouts because, well, you can no longer pass after the curve towards Pigan Pass. And that's where the speed limit changes from 45 to 35. Shuttle stops and a parking area tell you that this is a popular hiking area. The sign says Pigan Pass, and it's a trail I've enjoyed, especially the path through the scree field. But Saya Pass can also be reached from here, and it might be even better. This is the biggest of the two switchbacks on the east side. From here, the road climbs quickly, and around the next bend are a few pullouts with some of the best views in the park. This is one of those places where you can spend lots of time, just taking it all in. If all the pullouts here are taken, don't worry, there's more up ahead. There are tunnels on either side of Logan Pass. This is the East Tunnel. The tunnels opened in 1933. They were the last sections of the road to be completed during its nine-year construction. The final switchback on this side is just up the road, and at the far end is Lunch Creek. This is another one of my favorite photo spots in the park. And if you're lucky enough to be here in mid to late summer when the bear grass and other wildflowers are plentiful, then it's even better. As the road gets higher, the views get more spectacular. It's very hard to capture the true majesty of the place. As hard as I've tried, I just can't do it justice. It's really one of those places that you have to see in person to fully appreciate. And yes, you can ride a bicycle on the road, and a surprising number of people do it. And this ain't easy, because from the west, there's over 3,000 feet of elevation change. This is the area called the Big Drift. Each spring, up to 80 feet of snow collect here. This is Logan Pass. It's the highest part of the road. It's a very popular place, and the parking lot is often full by 8 in the morning. Even reservations for a red bus tour are often sold out for weeks. The free hiker shuttles, well, yes, they're first come, first serve, but even they can have long wait times. The visitor center houses several exhibits, a small gift shop, and a comfort station. In 2020, it was closed due to COVID. 
And FYI, the outbuilding was extremely fragrant in October. This is one of the world's special places, and it gets even better when you get away from the parking lot. And I highly recommend that you try at least one of the trails. Just behind the visitor center, a three mile round trip trail leads to Hidden Lake. It's one of the most popular in the park. Here, grizzlies and other wildlife are often seen. In fact, it's not uncommon for the trail to be closed because of too much grizzly activity. And on most days, there are only goats. This is Hidden Lake from the Overlook. On this day, this was as far as I could go because, well, a bear was spotted in the area. One of my favorite trails is just across the road from the summit side. The Highline Trail is part of the Continental Divide Trail that runs from Mexico to Canada. The farthest I've gone is the Mini Glacier, and the view from Swift Current Pass is one of my favorites. But you don't have to hike 15 miles to enjoy this trail. Just a 15 to 30 minute walk from the pass is amazing. And anyone in reasonable shape who's not afraid of heights should walk out to the shelf. It takes just 15 or so minutes to get to this view. On the way back, there's a nice view of the mountains and our road. Many people bring their dogs on their trips these days, and dogs are allowed in the park, but they are not allowed on the trails. And they must always be on a short leash. The symbol of the park is bighorn sheep. They can often be seen in or near the parking lot. And remember, these are wild animals, so don't approach them. The weather changes quickly up here. While it may be warm and pleasant in the valley, it can be cold and rainy or even sleeting or snowing at the pass. Clouds rush in from the west and are pushed upwards by the mountains. Cold precipitation is often the result during any month of the year. Meanwhile, east of the divide, only a few clouds may spill over the ridge. Most just evaporate in the dry air of the east. Back on the road, we begin the descent by passing another waterfall. But after just a short distance, we're going to stop. A short iron walkway leads to an overlook with an excellent view of the Continental Divide. This part of it is called the Garden Wall. The Highline Trail is carved into it, as is the Sun Road below. And you photographers out there should keep in mind that it's going to be in shadow until the sun hits it in the afternoon. And this overlook is a great place to take it all in. The descent is narrow, a bit twisty, and often crowded. Just west of the pass is Bird Woman Falls. It's one of the highest in the park. At 460 feet, it's still dwarfed by the mountains. The entire length of the road has been recently paved, but they're always making improvements, this time to a safety rail. On this road, always expect delays. Heaven's Peak is one of the most striking on the west side. Its distinctive shape tends to draw the eye, no matter the time of day. The sun hits it in the morning. In the afternoon, it's in silhouette. I love driving this road. But part of the experience is getting out of the car and just looking around. And there's a great parking area where you can do this at Haystack Creek. The creek and billion-year-old rock are up the slope. The last stretch of our road, it's at the bottom of the valley. And again, well, video just can't do this place justice. You really need to be here in person to get it. And that lady there, she gets it. She said it much better, but I wasn't rolling, so I asked her to say it again. You can't describe how beautiful this is. <laughs> that was a very sincere yeah. but, but you can't. See, she gets it. That's the weeping wall behind them. It's one of the landmarks on the road. It's called that because water weeps out of the rock during the early season snowmelt. It does more than weep making it a great place for photographers. Just past it, it gets twisty again. And it's easy to see why the Sun Road has a vehicle length limit of only 21 feet. 
anything longer, just can't make it around the bends. In the autumn, there's remarkable colors behind every corner. Much of this section hugs the cliff face. There's only one real switchback on the west side, and it's called the Loop. There's parking, a pit toilet, and more great views. This area has burned a couple of times in recent years, and an info sign tells the story. I was here in 2003 and saw it myself. It was the largest fire ever in the park. It burned much of the west side, including this area. I visited many times since then, but this is my first autumn visit. The color really helps differentiate old growth from the new. And of course, it's pretty. This spot also has the second best view of Heaven's Peak, even when it's a little smoky. The loop is also important for hikers. This trail heads up to Granite Park, where it connects to the Highline Trail and then Logan Pass. A hiker shuttle stops here to drop people off or to pick them up and bring them back to Logan Pass. The fall color makes it easy to see the size of the burn area, and it seems that deciduous trees are replacing some of the conifers. And that's McDonald Creek down the valley to the north. This is just another place in the park where it's really nice just to look around. The best, or at least my favorite view of Heaven's Peak, is just down the road a bit. This is the West Tunnel. There are pullouts on either side of it. And a short walk offers a little surprise. It's the best, or at least my favorite view of Heaven's Peak. And there's a viewing area on the other side. Avalanches are frequent occurrences during the spring snow melt. And here the power of an avalanche is clear to see. Safety and the time required to clean up these avalanches is another reason the road opens so late. The road eventually levels out and follows the contour of McDonald Creek. Several turnouts provide creek access. At first, it just trickles over Glacier's famous multicolored rocks. And in places, calm waters reflect fall color. Further down, there's small cascades. At Red Rock Point, there's bigger ones. The trail leads to a wooden overlook. At certain times of day, two-legged wildlife tend to visit the swimming hole. Curious types will find a few places to explore here. FYI, uh, several years ago, I broke a rib doing something similarly curious in this same area. But anyway. Soon you'll see another large parking area that's full by 8 o'clock in the morning. It's for the Trail of the Cedars. It's one of the most popular places in the park. Here, a 0.7-mile boarded wheelchair-accessible trail winds its way through an old-growth cedar forest. At the far end, you'll hear the sound of falling water. It's Avalanche Creek, where it narrows into a small but beautiful gorge. In October, the water is low. Earlier, it's much more dramatic. The bridge is a turnaround spot for most, but if you keep going for another tenth of a mile, you arrive at the trailhead for Avalanche Lake. The lake is just two miles and a moderate climb away. It's hard to believe that a place so lush, like this temperate rainforest, is just 40 miles from the dry grasslands on the east side. The road continues through the tree-lined valley near McDonald Creek. The pullout areas now have names. This is Sacred Dancing Cascade, but the water is too low for dancing. Take the short walk on a trail downstream to a bridge that's over the creek. From the bridge, there's a great view of the cascade. It's another great photo op. And below the bridge, there's plenty of space for quality family time. Back on the road, the speed limit here is 40 to provide a safety margin in case wildlife decide to cross the road. The creek empties into Lake McDonald. It's the largest lake in the park. The famous Lake McDonald Lodge is at the east end. We still have to drive the 10 mile length of the lake to get to our final stop. There are a few pullouts along the lake and from this one, if you look carefully, you'll notice that the far shore 
shows evidence of a large fire. Much of it burned in the historic 2003 fire, leaving many dead standing trees that were just waiting for the next fire. Then with a lightning strike in 2018, the fire returned, rebooting the forest life cycle once again. It typically takes two and a half hours to cross the Sun Road, depending on traffic and how many times you stop. I know most people stay on the west side of the park, so most of you will drive it from west to east instead of the way I took you in this video. But I hope I convinced at least some of you to get up early and see the east side of the park at sunrise. The Apgar town site is our end point. Now we've been on the road for a while and if you're in the mood for a snack, well, there are plenty of options here. Be sure to walk down to the beach at Lake McDonald. This is one of the most famous views in the park. It's best in the afternoon unless it's smoky like it was this day. Okay, now it's time to wrap this up. I hope you enjoyed our little journey. We started where the grassland prairie meets the mountains. We saw remnants of a glacier that carved them and the wildlife that call them home. The road took us to easy trails and provides us access to the Alpine backcountry. The trees and color remind us that our world is always changing and that there are different types of beauty when you look for it, perhaps in a dark rainforest. Nowhere else can you experience all of this in just a few hours, except on the amazing Going to the Sun Road. Hiking a trail with lots of elevation gain on the first day in the mountains is not a good idea. To help your body adjust, Spend your first day exploring the Sun Road or hiking a flat trail. One of the best flat hikes in the park is the Bullhead Lake Trail. It's in the Mini Glacier area. The trailhead is located near the Swift Current Motor Inn parking lot. The trail begins in trees. One is rather unique. After about five minutes, a spur trail leads to Fisher Cap Lake. Moose live in this area and they feed in the lake nearly every day. Some say that most of the images of moose you've seen in nature calendars were taken at this lake. They feed on plants that grow in shallow water. The females tend to feed in groups for up to hours at a time, providing plenty of time for photographers to get a nice shot. They train their young to hide in the nearby brush. Moose move methodically in the water, but they can move quickly when they want to. Moose are the largest members of the deer family. This is clearly apparent when they get on shore. They are accustomed to people, but they are still wild, and you shouldn't get too close. Bulls tend to feed by themselves. The best time to see them is late afternoon to early evening. Bears tend to come down here around dusk, so it would be a good idea to be off the trail by then. Deer also feed here, near the shore. A few minutes further down the main trail, there's an interesting green rock formation. In places, berries grow along the trail. They are a favorite food of bears. So where there are berries, there eventually will be bears to eat them. Talking, singing, or making any noise that sounds human is a good idea when walking in bear country. About a mile and a half from the trailhead, you're at the eastern end of Red Rock Lake. It's another third of a mile to Red Rock Falls. From time to time, the trail heads through trees. If you're alert, you might be lucky enough to see a moose. It's hard to believe that such a large animal can be so difficult to see. The trail goes through dense forest, and even moose get tired of bushwhacking through it. So occasionally, they take to the trail. Give them the right of way. Just before the falls, the geology gets bizarre again. Just imagine the forces required to bend this rock formation. Also notice that earlier the rock was green. Here it's red. Rangers frequently walk the trails looking for signs of bears. Anything out there of any interest? Well, fleeting sighting of a grizzly. This ranger was warning hikers that a grizzly was using the trail 
to get over the mountains via Swift Current Pass. Red Rock Falls is at the 1.8 mile point. This is a favorite spot for families. There are plenty of rocks for kids to climb on. So far the trail has gained only about 100 feet. It's another spectacular mile and a half to Bullhead Lake. The trail gains about 300 feet as it follows Swift Current Creek. The lake appears to be two, but they are connected by a narrow channel. At one point, if you look back, you can see the Many Glacier Hotel. By the way, those are moose tracks in the water. The larger pool is about three and a half miles from the trailhead. It's one of the most tranquil places in the park. Here you're surrounded by mountains on three sides. At the end of the valley, there are 3,000 foot waterfalls. There's an oddly bent rock formation where mountain goats sometimes feed. The lake is clear and blue. Primitive life can also be seen on this trail. The yellow and green blotches on these rocks are alive. They are lichen. Lichen grows very slowly. These swatches are likely to be hundreds of years old. For most, Bullhead Lake is the turnaround point. But the trail continues. 2,000 feet up and three miles from here is Swift Current Pass. And beyond it, Granite Park Chalet. The view from Swift Current Pass, it's one of my favorites in the park. When you're in the mountains, it's only natural that you want to hike them. But this trail is proof that short, flat hikes can be just as memorable as a long, steep one. Now let's hike to a glacier. It's a harder one. It's my favorite one. I've done it more times than I can count. It's also in Many Glacier. If you plan ahead and have a ticket for the boat, you can park at the Many Glacier Hotel. But if not, you're going to have to start early because there's limited parking at the trailhead for the amazing Grinnell Glacier Trail. The trailhead is located down the road from the Many Glacier Hotel. But if you want to shorten the hike by about three miles, take the boat. Even then, the hike is a strenuous one. In about four miles, you'll climb from 4,900 feet to 6,600 feet above sea level. Tickets for the boat ride and ranger-led hike sell out quickly, so it's a good idea to purchase your tickets a day or so in advance. The boat leaves from the dock behind the Mini Glacier Hotel. During the lake crossing, a ranger describes the scenery. Then there's a five minute walk to Lake Josephine, where another boat awaits. Those who start from the trailhead emerge from the trees near Lake Josephine's boat dock. They then follow the trail along the northern shore. The weather can change rapidly near the Continental Divide, and on this September morning, frost covered the gangway. After the hike when the boat picked us up, the temperature was near 70. Ranger hikes begin with a talk about safety. This is bear country, and bears have the right of way. We learn the best way to avoid a bear encounter is to make noise. When a bear hears a human voice, it will likely get out of the way. But if you surprise a bear, it's likely to be unhappy and you may have to use your bear spray to fend them off. The trail heads into the woods on a boardwalk over marshy ground. Just a few hundred yards from the boat landing, the climb begins. The trail gains a few hundred feet in the first 30 minutes, and on most days, the wind grows stronger. Soon, your efforts pay off with amazing views of Mount Gould, which dominates the head of the valley. On ranger-led hikes, you'll have plenty of time to rest as you learn about local geology, wildlife, or any subject in which the ranger is fluent. This ranger is into geology. She tells us sediments which make up the rock of this trail are very old. The layers were laid down hundreds of millions of years even before dinosaurs existed. 
Right next to the trail, there's evidence of the powerful forces which bent the rock and formed these mountains. Recently, rangers have had to explain one more thing, why so many trees in the area are dying. The answer is an infestation of a boring beetle in a budworm that feasts on new growth. The climb continues, and depending on the season, the foliage gets more colorful. Hundreds of millions of years ago, this entire area was under an ocean. This is fossilized seafloor. You can still see the ripples. It's now about 6,000 feet above sea level. There's a gentle rise over the next mile and a half, bringing Salamander Glacier into view, which is just above our destination. The saddle is reachable from the other side of the mountains via the High Line Trail. There are fewer trees the higher up you go, and the views of beautiful Lower Grinnell Lake get better and better. The lake gets its vibrant turquoise color from small rock particles that were scraped off by the glacier. There are other trails in the area. A trail on the opposite side of the valley leads to Pygen Pass. Bears aren't the only mammals on the trail. This little guy will attempt to get your food, but don't let him. In this section, Lower Grinnell Lake is a constant welcome companion. The scale of the scenery is hard to capture in a camera. Somewhere on that rock face is the trail. In a few minutes, you're beside another cliff face. In many places, the trail is little more than a narrow shelf carved into the rock. There are a number of waterfalls on the trail, but even in this remote location, parasites may be present, so water must be filtered before drinking. The glacier is now only about a mile away, and there's a small clearing. If this were midsummer, it would be filled with blooming bear grass. After the clearing, it gets steeper. It's a single track, wide enough for only one to pass at a time. Then there's an outcrop that provides one of the best views in the park. At one point, it's so steep that stairs are cut into the rock. Soon, you can hear the waterfall at the end of the valley, and there's another incredible view. Depending on your speed, you've been on the trail for two to three hours by this point, and you've climbed about 1,200 feet, so you need to be reasonably fit, or an eight-year-old boy accompanied by his rightfully very proud father. Grinnell Glacier is one of the most studied in the park. This lot is a U.S. Geological Survey team. At times, the trail can be quite narrow, Walking it may look perilous on camera, but it's not. Soon you can hear the waterfall. Eventually this meltwater will flow all the way to the Arctic Ocean. The trail was built in the early 1900s, but the first explorers bushwhacked their way up here in the 1850s. Back then the ice extended all the way to the fall. Turn around to see where you've come, and you'll see the U-shaped signature of a glacier carved valley and a string of aquamarine lakes. The boat dock, where we started, is at the near end of the second lake. Bears like this part of the trail because it's lined with berries. Ripe thimble berries actually taste pretty good. Just before the rest area is the best view of the formation called the Angel's Wing. It looks like half the mountain was sheared off, and it was, by a glacier that once filled this valley. The rest area is a large open area with benches and a pit toilet. It's about 0.3 to 0.4 tenths of a mile from the top of the trail. The hardest part of the hike is still to come, so this is a good place to stop, rest, have lunch, and maybe add a layer of clothing. Bighorn sheep frequently graze in the nearby meadow. This video was shot on a different day. If you're lucky enough to see a bighorn, remember that they are wild and unpredictable. The hike up the moraine to the Grinnell Glacier Overlook is steep. It rises almost 400 feet, and for many, it's the most strenuous part of the trail. When you're at the top, four miles from the boat dock, you may be tired, but the views are well worth the effort. If you're lucky, you may see a bighorn sheep up here too. Few continue to the glacier. Most just rest here and take in the amazing scenery. The glacier itself is still about a half mile away. 
Some even cool their feet in the very cold water. There's much to take in. The rock face is 3,000 feet high. The waterfall, nearly 1,000. Like Lower Grinnell Lake, the water here gets its striking color from glacial flour, scraped off by the glacier. Most of those who make it up here know that the glacier is shrinking, and they want to see it before it's gone. This film crew is from Japanese television. As glaciers die, crevasses form near the edge, or foot of the glacier. Ice then breaks off and becomes a berg. Bergs now cover much of the upper Grinnell Lake. Over time, some of the bergs turn on their side, revealing ice layers that are hundreds of years old. Layers are also visible on the wall of the arete. They were laid down over a billion years ago. This is Salamander Glacier. In the early 1900s, it was connected to Grinnell Glacier. Today, the two glaciers are separated by hundreds of feet of rock. To get to the glacier, you'll have to cross a stream. I've seen just how fast the ice is melting. When I was here in 1995, the glacier was about 500 feet longer than it is today. Back then, there were still small ice caves, and the rangers were giving tours on the ice. The ice is now thin and flat. In fact, it's far too thin to walk on safely. Glacier melt isn't always bad news. In the 1930s, ice covered this spot. When it melted, it revealed 1.4 billion, that's with a B, year-old fossils of what was once the Earth's dominant species. These are stromatolite fossils. These humble algae colonies are responsible for giving the Earth its breathable oxygen. Before them, the atmosphere was carbon dioxide, but their waste gas was oxygen. They were formed in warm, shallow seas, proof that this ice-covered mountaintop was once a tropical shoreline. By now, you might be wondering what sort of effort is required to reach this spot. So I asked hiker Tim Curry about his thoughts. And uh, that last four-tenths of a mile uh, was a little steeper than I, uh, uh, I expected. So was the effort worth the view? It was absolutely worth it. Uh, I would recommend this to anybody who's uh, of sound limb, but I wouldn't recommend it to anybody who was not quite in shape for the mountain because you do feel the altitude. It is a steep climb. It's very rocky, and you should be in shape for it. And fitness clearly is not based on age. This grandma did it, and she's... 77. And she didn't take the boat. She started from the trailhead, five and a half miles away. It took her four hours to get here. And what did she think of it? Ah, oh, it's marvelous. The Grinnell Glacier Trail is one of the most scenic in North America, and one of the few that follows a glacial valley past stunning vistas with an incredible lake, and then ends at a remnant of the last ice age. This is more than a beautiful place. It's also a great place to learn something about geology, the earliest forms of life, and climate change. So when you're in Glacier National Park, if you do only one hike, the Grinnell Glacier Trail is the one to do. Another of my favorite hikes starts at Logan Pass. No, it's not the Hidden Lake Trail. Sure, it's one of the park's most popular, but it's too crowded for me, so I've only done it once. And unless the weather is really nice, there's only a fair photo op at the top. I much prefer the High Line Trail, and it's connecting Swift Current Pass Trail, which takes you all the way to Many Glacier. It begins just across the road from the Logan Pass sign. If you're in good shape, you can take it over 15 miles all the way to Mini Glacier. But if that's too much for you, there are options. You can take it just 11.8 miles down to the loop on the Sun Road. Or you can take it for just over two miles to a place I call my lunch spot. This short option has spectacular views and because it's out and back, you don't have to arrange for transportation back to Logan Pass. I do at least one of these variations every single time I'm in the park. These days, parking at the pass is usually full by, well, just after sunrise. Even in October, I got there about 7.30 in the morning, and I was lucky enough to nab one of the last three parking spots. So if you're going to do this one, you might want to book a red bus tour a couple of months in advance, or be prepared to wait in line for a hiker shuttle. In this segment, I'm going to take you all the way down to Many Glacier. We'll traverse the famous shelf, walk along the garden wall, and take a break at my lunch spot, where we'll meet some goats. We'll climb up the haystack and endure a spur trail 
in the horribly steep trudge up to the Grinnell Glacier Overlook, before resting at the halfway point, which is Granite Park Chalet. Then we'll cross the Continental Divide over Swift Current Pass and hike down 2,300 feet to several lakes and Red Rock Falls to our journey's end at the Swift Current Motor Inn. This segment includes images from several of my hikes. A signpost at the trailhead reminds us that this is bear country. There are more than 500 grizzlies in the park, and as the sign says, there is no guarantee of your safety. As recently as 2019, a man went missing on this trail. But anyway, here's some advice, don't hike alone. As we descend a couple hundred feet on this easy slope, allow me to provide some trail difficulty info. A walk to my lunch spot is pretty easy, without a lot of up and down. The walk back up this slope is probably the hardest part. The hike down to the loop includes over 1,000 feet of up and over 3,000 feet of going down. And going down can be quite hard on your knees, especially if you're not using hiking poles. You need to add about a thousand feet of up and down if you decide to take the extra climb to the overlook. The hike to Mini Glacier has about the same amount of up and down as the loop trail, with a few more miles of flat hiking. This is the shelf. It was blasted into the several thousand foot high garden wall. It's so narrow that you have to stop to let other hikers pass. It can be scary for some, but there is a handy garden hose covered safety cable to hang on to. At least there is during the busy season. On this early October morning, it had already been stowed for the season. A little later in the morning, there is more sun on the trail and in the valley. And early on, the Sun Road is still within earshot. The cliff face is massive, but it's not until you get off the shelf and look back that you see just how big it is. But it's the view across the valley where you're most likely going to be looking. After just a few minutes, you're off the cliff face and the trail opens up a bit. Bears aren't the only wildlife feeding here. Bighorn sheep do too. Across the valley, the 492-foot Bird Woman Falls comes into view. The trail cuts across the safety of a scree field. Then you're back in the trees where bear precautions are necessary. Some wear bells on their boots to let bears know that they're coming. But most rangers say they're not loud enough. Hey, bear. Talking, singing, and generally hey, making bear. noise is deemed the best way to let a bear know that you're coming. And then they usually get out of the way. Some of the smaller creatures in the park may come out in hopes that you'll toss them a crumb or two, but don't. It's best to keep wild animals wild. The trail continues along the garden wall, and by now, you can no longer hear the traffic. It's only natural to spend most of your time looking down the trail. But the view up is also impressive. This is a place where you're truly surrounded by the magnificence of Mother Nature. At this point, we're only about an hour out from Logan Pass. It's been a pretty easy stroll. And if you're not going the whole way, remember you can turn around at any point. You never know what you're gonna see on the Highline Trail. Here a mountain goat family grazes next to the trail. These goats may seem cute and docile, and most of the time they are. Like all wild animals, they are unpredictable, and it's best to keep your distance. This part of the trail is pretty flat, and open, with fantastic views of the mountains on the other side of the valley. At a little over the two-mile point, there's another grove of trees, beyond which there's a right turn onto another shelf that's been carved into the cliff face. This is my lunch spot. And if you don't have the time or the energy to do an entire trail, this is a great turnaround point. I call it my lunch spot because the notches in the cliff make excellent picnic spots. Even if you're continuing on, they're a great place to take in the McDonald Valley while resting up for the 275-foot climb up to the haystack. This is also a great place to interact with other trail users. 
most are friendly. But some will insist that you get out of their way. When you see hikers heading the opposite way, it's a good idea to ask them if they've seen anything interesting. One time, a couple told me there were bighorn sheep grazing in the clearing just a few hundred yards down the trail. Bighorn sheep are the symbol of the park, and it's a treat to see just one. And sometimes you're lucky enough to see several of them doing what bighorn do. The open space and lush grass attract grazers, as well as their predators. On another hike, I nearly captured a grizzly hunting a mountain goat. It was a mama and her two cubs were nearby. Grazers think it's safer to be on rocky ledges. But seconds before I shot this video, this bear was chasing a goat. Bears are omnivores. That means they'll eat just about anything. They also can be territorial. This mama bear has cubs, and when she finds an area with plenty of berries, she'll defend it for her family. Luckily, these bears were about a thousand feet above the trail, but they can run at 35 miles an hour. And I was glad it didn't start heading my way because you need to remember that you're miles from the nearest road and hours away from any medical help. I was happy to see that they didn't come any closer. Luckily, this bear was just checking us out. The climb to the haystack is up a 275 foot switchback. It only takes a few minutes to climb it. There's a little saddle up here with a great view of the McDonald Valley. The ground is littered with rocks. Some of them are quite large. It's pretty close to the Continental Divide. The rocks either rolled down, but more than likely they were dropped by a glacier. This is a long hike. And except for the first time I did it, well, I didn't shoot any video on this part of the trail. So if you can excuse it, I'm gonna show some of this old video just to give you an idea of what the trail's like. For about the next three miles, the views are pretty much like this. Stunning. And there is evidence of past forest fires. For about the next three miles, we're paralleling the Continental Divide. Trees become more plentiful as we near the halfway point. After the trail takes a turn, there's a welcome sight in the distance. That's Granite Park. It's our halfway point. This signpost is a spur trail to the Grinnell Glacier Overlook. It's almost a mile long and goes up almost a thousand feet. I went up there the time I did the shorter loop version of this trail. The slog up was brutal for me, but I made it, and I was able to peek over the Continental Divide to Grinnell Glacier. I quickly went back down, and I was quite happy to rest for a while at Granite Chalet. Weirdly, you can buy snacks here, and they're not even overpriced. These buildings were built in 1914 and 15 by the Great Northern Railroad as a lodging site for their customers. You can still stay up here, though reservations are quite hard to get, and they're very basic. You even have to bring your own bedding. But I'm told the nights up here are close to magical. You'll have the opportunity to talk to several of your fellow hikers here, perhaps about how they're going to get back to their cars if they're only taking a one-way trip. After a brief respite, it's time to leave the Highline Trail and head over Swift Current Pass. A few trails meet here, so read the signs to make sure you don't take the wrong one. You may end up at the Swift Current Overlook a chalet stay makes these viewpoint hikes much easier. The trail up to the pass is a bit rockier than I remembered. It also has about five to 600 feet of up that I forgot about. It's just the kind of place where you might see bighorn. And I did. After about three quarters of a mile, I'm at the highest point of the day. It's about 7,200 feet at the pass. And I was feeling it. From here, the trail drops 2,300 feet most of it in the first two miles. If you're new to hiking, you may be surprised to learn that going downhill is harder on the joints. I'll use some of the old footage to illustrate. That was very close, hurt my right knee. It was steep, rocky, and perhaps due to my painful knee, well, I was in need of a, well, psychological boost. Well, that's what I came to see, this view, and I was tired. Expect that last bit of up, 500 feet or so of up. But the view is beginning to 
be there and uh, I can't wait to get a little further down the road. <sighs> Feeling better, heart rate's getting back down to 125. Nice cool breeze in my back. Sunny, it's a good day. After nine miles, I'm coming up to the view I've come to see. It's amazing. I'm at over 7,000 feet, looking 2,000 feet down a valley that was carved by a glacier 12,000 years ago, leaving a chain of beautiful lakes. In addition, I can faintly hear the sound of 3,000 foot waterfalls. This is a special place. There is no other way to see this. You have to hike here. You'll have to endure exhaustion, blisters, and pain while hauling yourself, your sustenance, and your cameras for eight hours to see this. They say that you appreciate things more when you earn them, and they're right. As the map shows, there are several switchbacks. You can just make one out in this old video. After crossing yet another shelf, you're close to the falls. If anything, the view only gets better. The falls begin at a melting glacier. This trickle will soon join others, forming the Swift Current River. I've done this part of the trail twice, and I wish I had more picks. Both times, I was simply too distracted by the valley. This guy found a place to wait for his buddies in the shade, who went up to the Swift Current Lookout. Several wide-eyed minutes later, I'm on the valley floor. I look back and realize that this meltwater is just starting a journey that will end in the Arctic Ocean. And by the way, it's important to learn the types of scat. That was dried bear scat. The first suspension bridge means that there's four miles to go. The second is a half mile later, near Bullhead Lake. And yes, this part of the trail is the same one we were on earlier when we went to Bullhead Lake. And yes, this is the lake. As I've been here many times before, well, I'm not stopping as often to shoot pictures. Frankly, I was tired and sore. So I did the last three miles in less than an hour, including a stop to Red Rock Falls. It's just a short walk off the main trail, and it means I'm only 1.8 miles from the end. While it would be nice to stay and appreciate it, I do so only briefly. It's been a long day and I'm much more interested in basking in the luxury of a sparse TV-less room with my boots off. Several minutes later, eight hours after starting out and carrying a lifetime of memories with me, that's what I did. You may be wondering how I got back to my car at Logan Pass. Well, I prepaid for a red bus ride for the next morning. And yes, I could have done that today or taken my chances with a hiker shuttle, but I decided to drive up. In 2021, you can now also book reservations on hiker shuttles. But I got lucky. It turns out that while waiting for a table at the diner, I ran into the guy who was waiting on the trail. And after his buddies showed me the pictures they took at Swift Current Lookout, we started talking about getting back to the pass. And it turns out they had pre-planned. They had staged one of their cars here at the Motor Inn. And they were kind enough to let me bum a ride back to Logan Pass. And to pass it forward, I donated my red bus ticket to someone else who needed to get to Logan Pass in the morning. As I've said, the Swift Current Motor Inn is one of my favorite places to stay. It doesn't have the view of the Mini Glacier Hotel or an impressive lobby. But you're looking at my door, and right behind me is the trailhead for the Bullhead Lake Trail. And one of the more popular trailheads, the one to Iceberg Lake and Tarmigan Tunnel, is just a few steps away by those trees. And that's where the next two videos begin. Bears seem to love this trail, as you'll see in the first video. In the second video, well, it was shot a while ago because it was one of my most memorable hikes ever. And I hope it encourages you to be prepared for changing weather.
The Iceberg Lake Trail is a popular day hike in the Many Glacier area. It's a moderately easy hike of 9.4 miles with only 1,200 feet of elevation gain. It features nice views of the surrounding valley, a small waterfall, and it ends at Iceberg Lake, which is surrounded on three sides by 3,000-foot cliffs. The trailhead is behind the Swift Current Motor Inn. The trail begins with a steep 200-plus foot climb until it meets the main trail. Take it to the left. You're now high enough to see the surrounding valley and its prime bear habitat. The trail climbs gradually, occasionally traversing a grove of trees. But most of the time, you're above the trees, where there's nothing to obstruct the views of the valley. When entering a grove, it's particularly important to make noise as a standard bear precaution. This was the first day the trail was opened, after weeks of closure due to bear activity. This is bear scat. It's proof that the bear threat is real. It takes less than an hour and a half to walk the two and a half miles with 700 feet of elevation gain to Tarbigan Falls. They aren't much to look at when the water is low, as it was on this day. But there are plenty of places to sit and to take a breather. It's a great place to get to know your fellow hikers. This couple is from Massachusetts. They wanted to see some wildlife. Where Susie got to see, finally got to see a grizzly. That was her goal. She wanted to see a grizzly. From a distance. We, yeah, we wanted to see them from a distance. That's right. Not up close and personal. They didn't know it, but very soon they would see another. And this time, it wouldn't be from a distance. After the falls, the trail is in the trees. Soon you come to an intersection. The trail to the right rises another 1,700 feet to the Tarbigan Tunnel and the amazing view on the other side. The trail to the lake goes straight. A few minutes later, I saw a group heading back down the trail. I recognized many of them from the picnic area at the falls. Why were they heading this way so rapidly? Some were nervously smiling, but nobody would stop their retreat to tell me. Soon I joined the retreat. Eventually, I did learn that a mama bear and two cubs were also using the trail. One hiker took these pictures and some video with a little point-and-shoot camera. Usually, bears will try to avoid humans. These blocked the trail and headed towards them. They got quite close. This is potentially a very dangerous situation. They were very lucky. The mama was only interested in teaching her kids how to find and eat berries. I and others had bear spray but none of us wanted to have to use it. After several minutes of backtracking, we saw another group coming. The lady in orange is a trail tour guide, leading a group from the Boston area. We all felt that she knew best how to handle the situation. Then someone came up and said he saw the bears leave the trail and go up the hill. So we decided we could continue, but we did so as one large group. There is safety in numbers. Secretly, I'm sure all of us were checking out the others in the group trying to determine who was the slowest, while at the same time, hoping that an old joke wouldn't come true. Fifteen minutes later, in a clearing, one hiker showed us her photos of the bear. She was quite close to it. I've seen what happens when a bear attacks on this very trail, and it's not pretty. The victim I saw in 1994 struggled down the trail, covered in blood. This witness explains what he saw. I saw him. Uh, he has a lacer deep laceration on the top of his head, and one across the, the chest and one on the back. It would have taken the victim three or four hours to get to the nearest hospital by car. And by then, it might be too late. So a helicopter was called. In the next week, he had to endure four operations. But he did survive. Youthful enthusiasm can be nothing more than naivete. This time, we were lucky but the danger was real, and the trail was again closed the next day. The trail continues to rise very gently, and it never feels like you're climbing, until the last little bit just before the lake. The trail then descends to the lake. The bergs that gave it its name are long gone, but it's still an amazing sight. Including rest stops, it took about three and a half hours to get here. The icebergs that gave the lake its name are long gone, but it's still an amazing sight. 
the lake is surrounded on three sides by 3,000-foot cliffs. Numerous rocks provide plenty of space for even our large group to spread out and enjoy the quiet of the place. I stayed for about an hour, taking photos and fending off squirrels. We again grouped up for the hike down. It took less than two and a half hours. Recently, rules have changed to allow the carriage of handguns on the trails. One of our group had one, and I was glad for it. The Iceberg Trail is a popular day hike because it's an easy nine plus mile stroll. It's a great first day hike before taking on something a little more challenging. It offers a wonderful view of an alpine valley, and of course the amazing one of a kind Iceberg Lake. This segment describes the hike to the Tarbigan Tunnel from the Many Glacier area. The first two and a half miles rises just about 700 feet until the Tarbigan Falls. From there, the trail climbs another 1,000 feet in a mile and a half to Tarbigan Lake. The final push is a 600 foot, one mile climb to the tunnel and the amazing view on the other side. The trail is shared by the Iceberg Lake Trail, and the trailhead is located behind the Swift Current Motor Inn parking lot at about 5,300 feet. The footage from here hike to Iceberg Lake because I used a better camera. The steady climb is mostly out of the trees with nice views of the surrounding mountains. The area is frequented by bears who make noise and practice other bear safety precautions. The temperature was in the 40s and the sky was threatening on this early September day. One of my favorite things about hiking in Glacier is the tree line is pretty low and you're often hiking above it. So here you get to see the mountains, not just a bunch of trees. The trail does go through a few groves and in one of them there was some bear scat. If you haven't seen bear scat before, you need to know what it looks like. Big pile of bear scat. This pile is a bit old. So hopefully the bear left the area. This was the first day the trail had been open in weeks because of bear activity. It was closed the next day for the same reason. And if you see bear scat, be alert. These folks were heading to the Iceberg Lake, but now they're retreating because a mama bear and two of her cubs were using the trail. I got this footage from a hiker who got out of the way and shot some phone footage of the bear family. This footage was responsible for closing the trail the next day. Bear activity frequently closes this trail, so if it's open, do it, because it might be closed tomorrow. The bears were seen heading safely into the woods, so the group turned around again and headed back to Iceberg. The first leg of the trail ends at Tarbigan Falls, and here they are. In the case you're wondering how long it took a 50-year-old man to get there, Tarbigan Falls took an hour and two minutes or so to get here. Well, the falls are nice, but not spectacular, especially when the water is this low. But it's a good place to have a snack and rest before the steepest part of the trail. Not far from the bridge, there's a side trail with a signpost pointing to the Tarbigan Tunnel. The Tarbigan Trail goes to the right and up the slope. And I knew this was going to be a tough hike. It's 2,300 feet up from the trailhead. So on this leg of the journey, I decided to take the lightest camera I owned at the time. It wasn't a very good camera, so I shot some stills, too. The weather kept changing, and while there were clearings, much of the trail is in dense forest, which makes it easier to surprise a bear. And after about an hour or so, I was well above treeline and in a cirque. There was also a hole next to the trail, which was recently dug, you know, probably by a bear. Here's some of the bad video of the Cirque and Tarmigan Lake. Miles away. It was drizzling and getting colder. And one reason I'm showing you this shot is just to point out how quickly cameras have gotten better. The camera used here isn't that old, but it uses an obsolete technology called videotape. Today, cell phones have much better cameras. And the switchbacks may look like they're cut into a sheer cliff wall, but they weren't too bad. It took only 20 minutes to climb the remaining 600 vertical feet to the tunnel. Here are my first impressions. Okay, two hours, 49, 48 minutes. Heart rate 119, it was much, it was 140, so I'm coming up this hill. Last bit of 600 feet up. There's switchbacks in the trails. Not fun. Started out five and a half, 5.2 miles that way. Started raining 
bottom of the lake, or well, halfway up the lake. There's the tunnel. It's cold, it's raining. It's cold, it's raining, I'm here. I'm tired. But the view's not bad. You know, it's not bad. I'm not sure it's worth all this effort, but I've finally been here and I've done it. My disappointment wouldn't last for long. This is the tunnel. It's only about 60 feet long. And the day before, it was occupied by a bear who was using it as a shelter. But this is the view from the other side. It definitely made this trip worth all the effort. The rapidly changing weather was a bit unnerving, but it made for very dramatic and impressive images. To the right, you see red rock that was laid down in a shallow sea millions of years ago. And that's Elizabeth Lake in the valley. There were a few other hikers up there, and we discussed the situation. While I was talking to one of them, I looked down, straight down. Then I quickly snapped several pictures. And it's a good thing I did, because a few minutes later, the clouds had moved in. And visibility dropped to near zero. It was time to start thinking about getting back down, safely. I took in the view for a while, but once the view had gone, there was no reason to stay. It was time to start thinking about heading down. They said a cold front was coming through. I don't think it was coming through till tomorrow. On the other side, the clouds were even more dramatic. They were just rolling over the 8,000-foot divide. And by the way, I was so captivated by the weather that once again, I forgot to take a shot inside the tunnel. And when you're out here, you're pretty much on your own. There are no reliable weather forecasts here. And the mountains tend to make up their own weather anyway. And remember, there's no cell phone coverage. So you can't call somebody or look at a radar app on your phone. It's an interesting predicament. There are over five miles and 2,300 feet of potentially slippery slope to go. And the trail goes through lightning attracting, tree lined bear country. It's impossible to know whether it's better to wait or to go. So I just enjoy the uniqueness of the experience. <laughs> It really was quite amazing. Then I had a snack and was about to head down. It's sleeting pretty good. Cold fronts come through. When it started to sleet. Well, people just came down. If it continued, it would be a rather slippery descent. So once again, I had to decide, do I stay or do I go? Well, I decided to go. 45 minutes later, I was 1,300 feet lower. It was raining, and this is what I had to say. It's 36 degrees, I'm fogging up. About a thousand more feet to down to go, about three miles or so, maybe two. It's pretty cool, but now it was kind of scary before. And after the rain came the fog. The video camera kept fogging up, so I switched to the still camera again. Sometimes this hindered the view. At other times, it made it interesting. And when I got below the fog, the clouds got really interesting. I've hiked hundreds of miles in this park, and this hike was one of the most memorable. The cold, rain, sleet, and fog made it special. And I also captured one of my favorite images. I've shot thousands of images here since 1994. And in the few minutes that the valley and hill and lake was visible, I was able to stitch together one of my favorite shots. So let's do a quick recap on the Tarbingen Trail hike. It is one of my favorites. And the trailhead is just behind the Swift Current Motor Inn. It starts out in the open, and it's pretty easy. And then it gets quite hard on the way up. It is frequented by bears. It's often closed because of too much bear activity. So if you're here and the trail happens to be open, take it when you can. You never know when it's going to be closed. And later in the year, August, September, it's much more likely that that will happen. As we've seen, trailheads can have multiple destinations. And that's the case a few miles east of Logan Pass on the Sun Road. The park map calls the area Saya Bend. Oddly, the trailhead sign says Pigan Pass. From here, you can hike to Pigan Pass and to the more difficult Saya Pass. Pigan Pass is a nine mile round trip and it gains a little over 1,700 feet. Saya Pass is also about a nine mile round trip, but it has about 400 more feet of up. It's a good thing the hiker shuttle stops here, as the limited parking fills up early. 
I did this hike on the last day of one of my trips. I had already hiked over 40 miles that week and, well, my body was feeling it. Since I hadn't done either trail, I decided on the one with less up, Pigan Pass. I also brought along only my lightest cameras. Sadly, it was before I had a GoPro. The trail starts by following this creek. It soon loops back into the trees and stays there for about two-thirds of the hike as it steadily climbs. The forest is dense with limited views, so I called out, Hey, bear! pretty often. You have to cross a few creeks, some without bridges like this one. At one point, I came across some deer. After just over a mile, the trail connects to the Continental Divide Trail, which is kind of cool, and that's the one we're going to take all the way to Pigan Pass. You can go to the right to another trailhead for this hike at Jackson Glacier Overlook on the Sun Road. So you can make this a point-to-point -point trail, but then, of course, you have to arrange for transportation. There aren't many views in the forest, but there was this one. There's another trail junction at about the three-mile point. The Saya Pass Trail goes off to the right. I continued on the Continental Divide Trail to the pass. A half a mile later, just as I was relieved to be getting out of the trees, I had to step over this reasonably fresh bear scat as I reached for my pepper spray. It's not until you get out of the trees that I think the trail gets interesting. There's a view across the valley, and also a view of the only glacier in the park that hasn't shrunk very much in the last 80 years. It's Pigan Glacier. But it's the view ahead that makes this trail unique. This is the part that you can see from the road. From there, it doesn't look that interesting or even that long. The brain just can't figure out the scale of it. At least not until you're about halfway across it. I can't think of any other trail I've been on that's straight for almost a mile and a half with no trees or other nearby reference points. Crossing it was as strange as it was memorable. I don't know if it was a steep slant of the mountain, the lack of reference points, or, or maybe an ear-migrating sinus infection, but for the first time ever, I had to concentrate a bit to keep my balance. Otherwise, it's an easy, gentle climb to the pass, which is in a little cull. It was sheltered from the wind a bit, and there was a small lake to look at, but there's not really much else up here. The Continental Divide Trail continues down to Grinnell Lake and the Many Glacier Road. So you can make this a 13-mile point-to-point trip, as this guy did. If you're here and feeling pretty good and maybe ready for a little more, consider going up to Saya Pass, too. Then you can come back the way you came, or you can head down to one of the other trailheads. The green dots, they show the route to the Jackson Glacier Overlook. The red dots? They show the trail that goes all the way to Sunriff Gorge. And, of course, you'll have to take a hiker shuttle or some other means to get back to where you started. Hello, fellow nature lovers. This is the third updated version of my Glacier National Park lodging video. It's a tour of all the Grand Historic Lodges and the more affordable motor inns and cabins. And this time I've added some information about the things to do around each of them. Also, for the first time, I've included the backcountry chalets and the park's campgrounds. These days, so many people visit the park that only a select few are lucky enough to stay in it. So, once again for the first time, this edition includes a section on off-site lodging, as well as all the info you need to get an entry reservation ticket. Because if you're staying outside the park, you won't be allowed to enter the park at either end of the Sun Road without one. Now, if you're staying in the park, you get one automatically. But if you're not, well, you may have to jump through a few hoops, and this video will help you do that. So if this video helps you plan your trip, please click the like button and subscribe for easy access for over four hours of informative and beautifully shot videos on Glacier, my favorite park. My channel also has hours of more video on other interesting places. Okay, let's get started. I prefer to stay in the park to be close to the trails and the scenery. But these days that's tricky because there's less than 1,000 rooms in the park and they are booked nearly as soon as they become available. And due to high demand, they may be too expensive for a typical family. So most visitors have to stay outside the park. On the west side, where the airport is, several small towns cater to tourists. So there's lots of off-site options and they tend to have luxuries that you can't get in the park, like a TV and cell phone service. 
In a bit, I'll take you on a tour of my favorite little place, the Mini Golden Inn, on the west side. There are fewer options on a Blackfeet-controlled east side, but I have a feeling that it won't be long before it's built up as well. The largest hotels are historic beauties, built by the Great Northern Railway. They have floors that creak, walls that are thin, no televisions, and beautiful lobbies with very slow Wi-Fi. They are so remote that lodging is available only about 100 days per year. When the park opened in 1910, tourists came by way of the Great Northern Railway to East or West Glacier. They toured the park on horseback. At the end of each day's ride, they stayed in tents or small chalets, also built by the railroad. Those accommodations weren't quite good enough for the wealthy Easterners who tended to take such trips. So the Great Northern started building large, modern hotels in spectacular places. These hotels are much the same today as they were when they were built around 100 years ago. The rooms are basic by today's standards. If you're expecting features and amenities that you would find in any major city hotel, well, you're going to be disappointed. Here there are few modern conveniences to isolate you from the natural wonder that surrounds you. Wi-Fi is a recent offering, but it's slow and only available in the lobby. You should also expect your cell phone not to work unless you're near Apgar on the east side. You can still get here by train. At East Glacier, you'll disembark in front of the Glacier Park Lodge. It opened in 1913 on the Blackfeet Reservation just outside the southeast corner of the park. There are 161 guest rooms, a restaurant, a bar, and even an espresso stand. The gift shop features local Blackfeet crafts. The lobby is impressive. 60 40-foot long timbers support the multi-story structure. The timbers were all several hundred years old when cut. In 2018, a multi-year restoration project began to replace the 100-year-old timbers, and they're doing it in a way to maintain the historic nature of the lobby. And the rooms are nice, too. And back in the day, this was a destination hotel. So there's an outdoor swimming pool, a nine-hole golf course, a nine-hole pitch and putt course, and a day spa. And there's red bus tours and the shuttle service to the rest of the park. This is the only lodge outside the park. The Two Medicine Park entrance is 15 minutes down the road. Experienced backpackers will tell you that the best multi-day hikes in the park are here. And there are also great day hikes and short strolls to waterfalls. And the benches, well, they're a great place to enjoy a quiet moment. There are boat tours too. And some of the trailheads are on the other side of the lake. So why not combine a boat ride with a hike? I've done that. Hardier types can stay in the campground where sites are available on a first come, first serve basis. My earlier videos mentioned that this part of the park is often less crowded than the rest. That may no longer be the case as I I think this place has been discovered. The little village of East Glacier is one of the few on the east side of the park that has a few motels. They're small, family owned, and generally more affordable than the lodge. The town also has a few places to eat. You can even rent a car. A further 20 minutes away is the larger town of Browning. I had a bad experience there once and, well, I haven't been back. Our next destination is 50 miles up the east side of the park. It's a scenic hour-plus drive that weaves its way through rolling prairie on its way to the Many Glacier area in the park's largest lodge, the Many Glacier Hotel. Its Swiss style blends in spectacularly with the landscape. The five-story hotel opened in 1915. The Great Northern Railway promoted it as one of the most noteworthy tourist hotels ever erected in America. It's located on Swift Current Lake. It has 214 guest rooms, and most were renovated in 2016. They're simple, but comfortable. Its primary asset is its old world charm and the spectacular setting. This is the view from the back deck of the lobby, and it's the same for those with a balcony. The hotel has a bar, a lounge, and fine dining. And sometimes there's musical entertainment too. Many Glacier is a day hiker's paradise. Many of the most popular trails in the park are here. The trails are so popular that during the high season, rangers are often forced to close the road to vehicles because of lack of parking. It's only reopened 
as others drive out. This is also a great place to see wildlife. If you're coming here to see bears, this is one place to see them. There's also moose, they feed in the nearby lake, and bighorn and goats frequent the hillsides. Once I was lucky enough to even see a porcupine. If you're just looking for a room, go about a mile down the road to the Swift Current Motor Inn and Cabins. The Motor Inn's rooms are larger than the standard rooms in the hotel, and you can park near your door. And many trailheads, where they're literally just a few feet away. This is my favorite place to stay, but it's become so popular that it's been years since I've been able to book a room here. I've also stayed in the cabins. Most one-bed cabins have a bathroom and hot water, but some do not. All the two-bedroom cabins have bathrooms and hot water, but they're all basic. But when you're here just for the trails, what more do you need? Public bathrooms and showers are just a few yards away, near the public laundry. There's another little building here that they call the Motel Pine Top. It has small rooms and thin walls, and when I stayed there, well, I got bed bugs, and I brought them home with me, which is not fun. But I'm sure they've solved that problem by now. There's a large campground across the parking lot. It accepts RVs and tents. Most of the sites are available on a first-come, first-served basis. This is one of a couple of camping areas that accepts reservations. The lobby of the Motor Inn, it's functional. It adjoins the rebranded restaurant that's moderately priced, generally healthy, reasonably tasty, and, well, I can highly recommend the pizza. The Swift Current Camp Store is opposite the diner. It's well equipped with reasonably priced food and supplies, including bear spray. More importantly, there's also Huckleberry Soft Serve Ice Cream. Even if you're not a hiker, there's much to do in Many Glacier. Every night in the Swift Current parking lot, there's a wildlife spotting party. As animals feed on the mountainside, a ranger's spotting scope lets you see them up close. This is a great way to see bears safely from a distance. This day, there were bighorn sheep on one slope and mountain goats on the opposite slope. Near the campground, there are informative ranger programs. I've heard many of these and, well, they're always interesting. There's also talks in the Mini Glacier Hotel, often with a slideshow. The lake the moose feed in, Fisher Cap Lake, it's a short walk from the Swift Current Lobby, and they're here most evenings. During the day, there are boat tours on Swift Current Lake and nearby Lake Josephine. Canoes and kayaks can be rented, but if you want a sailboard, well, you're gonna have to bring your own. If photography is your thing, Mini Glacier is for you. Sunrise in front of the Mini Glacier Hotel is one of the best you will ever see. And the sunsets, well, they're not bad either. Seeing things like this is one of the best reasons to stay in the park. I took all of these images in Many Glacier. With no traffic, it will still take two to two and a half hours to get here from the towns on the west side. In 2021, there's going to be construction on the Mini Glacier Road, which will add an estimated 40 minutes to your travel time, both in and out of the area. And if you're not staying here, the wait may be even longer due to overcrowding. If you're going to spend a few days in the park, take the time, endure the traffic, do whatever you have to do to spend at least one of them in Mini Glacier. We're going to make a couple of stops on our way to the last of the historic lodges. Our first is about 40 miles south in the town of St. Mary. It's just outside the east entrance of the Sun Road. Here you'll find a gas station and a hotel that's not in the park system. There are also many houses and cabins for rent. Depending on your provider, you may have cell service here that reaches about four miles inside the park. And this section of road is particularly nice in the morning. And you got a really good chance of seeing it if you're staying at the Rising Sun Motor Inn and Cabins. Unfortunately, its campground will not open in 2021. Like the rest of the east side, everything else at Rising Sun was closed in 2020 due to COVID. It was a sad sight. I'm not too happy about the yellow paint either. In previous years, it was a more pleasant brown. The rooms and cabins are similar to those found at Swift Current. They are simple, basic, and comfortable. The cabins are tucked away in the woods, and they're a step up from those found at Swift Current. There's also a camp store and a restaurant, similar to those at Swift Current, and I've eaten at this one many times. 
The short trails to waterfalls, they're just a little further down the road. I stay here when my plan is to photograph the many sights along the Sun Road. There's lots of nice scenery here. Wild Goose Island viewpoint, it's just up the road. This is an amazing spot that should be visited often. And from Rising Sun, you can because it's just a few miles away. In Logan Pass, it's just 12 miles up the road. As the park map shows, there are many trails in the area too. So when you're looking for adventure near the Sun Road, you should at least try to stay at the Rising Sun Motor Inn. Okay, now let's cross over the divide and check out the accommodations on the park's west side. Just a few miles from the west entrance, there are a few buildings on the western shore of Lake McDonald. This is the town of Apgar. And this is a place where your cell phone just might work. Apgar has restaurants, shops, kayak rentals, and other services. And of course, there's a campground. And this one's pretty big. And there's a large amphitheater for ranger talks. The inn is smaller than the other inns in the park, but it sits on the shore of the largest lake in the park, Lake McDonald. And you have to pay a bit more for the view. About 10 miles west on the Sun Road is the only historic hotel on the west side. It's Lake McDonald Lodge. The three and a half story structure is on the eastern shore of Lake McDonald and it opened in 1914. The lodge, like others in the park, is of the rustic Swiss chalet style with gabled roofs and balconies. The lobby is smaller than the others, but it's still a nice space. And a large fireplace covers one wall. The lodge has 100 guest rooms when you include the cottages that are out back and its motel style motor inn. And of course, there's a gift shop, a camp store, a lounge, and a restaurant. And you can go to the website and see the menu. From here, you can grab a red bus to tour the park or have a cruise on Lake McDonald. I like to visit the park around Labor Day, but late in the year, forest fires are much more likely to affect your trip. In 2015, 17, and 18, fires canceled my trips. The one in 2018 was really bad. Several cabins and privately owned residents around the eastern shore of Lake McDonald were destroyed, and the Lake McDonald Lodge was closed for the season. Fires don't have to be in the park to cause a problem. Several of my trips have been affected by smoke from fires that were hundreds of miles away. In early October of 2020, this was my view of Lake McDonald. Luckily, the wind direction changed the next day, but smoke still obscured the scenery. So my pictures were not as pretty as usual. Before I tell you about the backcountry chalets, I need to mention the classic hotel that's in Glacier's sister park, Canada's Waterton Lakes National Park. In 1932, these parks were united to form the first International Peace Park. It's here where the Great Northern built the Prince of Wales Hotel in a pretty good spot. As the name suggests, the hotel features British charm, with a high tea served daily. The hotel overlooks the town site of Waterton. There are a number of other hotels and tourist services in the town. The lake straddles the U.S. and Canada border. A cruise can take you to trailheads along the shore and to the U.S. side's tiny outpost called Goat Haunt, if it's open. Other water activities are available on Lake Cameron, about 20 minutes away. Hikers have several options depending on your ability. The fittest should do the Crip Lake Trail. It's a tough one, but amazing. This old hotel has just 86 rooms, so only the privileged few get to stay here. But all of us get to enjoy the view. At the opposite end of the comfort spectrum, you can reserve backcountry camping permits throughout Glacier National Park. You'll have to pack out what you pack in, and you'll have to secure your food from bears. But there is an easier way to stay in the backcountry. Remember I said early visitors stayed in chalets throughout the park? Well, two of them are still around. Granite Park Chalet is in a notch below Swift Current Pass. The only way to get there is to hike. The easiest way starts seven miles away at Logan Pass. You have to bring your own bedding and you don't know who else is going to be in the bunkhouse with you, but it is drier than a tent. The other chalet has been recently resurrected. The original Sperry Chalet was gutted by a forest fire in 2017. It was rebuilt with the help of donations in time to accept visitors in 2021. The Sperry Chalet offers more conventional rooms and meals compared to Granite Chalet, 
and you can get there after a long hike, or you can come by horse with the help of a local vendor. Reservations for the chalet, like everything else in the park, are very hard to come by. And well, I've never been lucky enough to get one. But I'm still trying. Like I said, I prefer to stay in the park, but these days, there just aren't enough rooms. So they have to be booked many months in advance, and, well, they're pricey. At least the lodges are. And I'm sure I'm not the only one who can't always plan months or even a year in advance. So most visitors have to stay outside the park. Last fall, I had COVID-induced cabin fever. Less than 48 hours later, I was in my favorite place. It was early October, and everything in the park was closed. So I had to stay outside the park. I know that's what most glacier visitors do, but for me, it was something I've hardly ever done. But with the overcrowding issues, it's likely to be the only way I'll be able to visit the park in the future. And after my recent experience, I'm not going to mind as much. Because I found a great little place that's just 10 miles from the West Park entrance. But before I tell you about it, let's talk about the other options outside the park. Most of the rooms are in towns west of the park, not far from the airport. There's Hungry Horse, Columbia Falls, Whitefish. They all have nice hotels, and of course so does Kalispell, which is the largest town in the area, and it's where the airport is. If you're traveling with kids, you might want to check out the Flathead Lake area. I've already talked about the limited options on the east side of the park. And for the year of COVID, well, I couldn't have gone there anyway because it was all closed. But in the future, it wouldn't surprise me if the Blackfeet take advantage of the need for more rooms on the east side. They just might do what the Navajo have done in Monument Valley. They just might build and run their own hotel. And by the way, there are RV parks and campgrounds on both sides of the park. Well, anyway, back to my trip. I conducted my search with Google Maps. I didn't use a travel site because those corporations take 15 to 20% of the booking. And that's a lot for a small business. Because I have so much equipment, I prefer to stay in the first floor of places where I can back right up to my room. It makes unloading and loading much easier. So I wasn't looking for a big hotel. And as I was scrolling around on Google Maps, I found this place just 10 miles from the park entrance in the town of Hungry Horse. As a small business owner myself, I support other small businesses. The Mini Golden Inn was built by a retired Navy man who was paralyzed by a drunk driver while on active duty. Today it's managed by his daughter and her handsome Malamute. And yes, your dog is welcome too. The veteran designed nine of the rooms to be wheelchair friendly. And for security, there's even a peephole at wheelchair height. This is one of the wheelchair friendly rooms. As you can see, it's big. It has a kitchenette, a nice size fridge, and a dining table. And this is the really big bathroom. A wheelchair can actually roll right into the shower. It was in a nice location too. There's a grocery store right across the street, which made it easy to get provisions for my days in the park and to cook my own meals when I got back to the room. This was a great place for this minor filmmaker, but it was also good enough for international movie star Ewan McGregor. He stayed here while shooting a motorcycle road trip show. By the way, even the standard rooms are quite big and have two beds. I stayed for five nights, which gave me an idea of how most people experience the park. After a long day exploring and hiking, it was nice to return to a large temperature controlled room with a fridge and a stove and working Wi-Fi. It turns out there are advantages to staying outside the park. And I'll be back to the Mini Golden. The Park Service has created one big disadvantage to staying off-site. You now need a reservation to use the Going to the Sun Road. And why are they doing this? Well, let's face it, the park is simply overcrowded. Traffic and wait times spoil much of the fun. So from Memorial Day weekend through Labor Day, a reservation ticket is now required between the hours of 6 a.m. and 5 p.m. to enter the park at the St. Mary or West Glacier entrances. If you're staying in the park, or if you have reservations for a boat tour or red bus tour, well then you automatically have a reservation for the Sun Road. Print out your reservation and show it to the ranger at the entrance to get your time-stamped Sun Road ticket. Everyone else will have to go online up to 60 days before their trip 
to try to get one of the limited number of tickets that are available for each day. And those tickets are then good for seven days. This is a big important change and you need to understand what it means for you. So check the park's website or watch a little video I created that explains all the details. I've added it at the end of this segment. Well, that's about all I've got to say about the amazing lodges in Glacier National Park. Staying in them is a special experience. They're in great locations, making it easy to get on the trails, but it's hard to book a room, and frankly, they're getting too expensive for many. But if you can't get a room in the park, that shouldn't discourage you from going to Glacier. There are plenty of options just outside the park boundary, and I'm surprised to say, well, there's some advantages to staying off site, as long as you can get a Sun Road ticket. I prefer to visit around the 1st of September, when the crowds and temperatures tend to be, well, a little bit more moderate. But the end of the season is much more likely to be impacted by forest fires. In 2017 and 2018, fires kept me away. I've been in the park four times when there have been fires nearby, and I've seen the devastation as well as the rebirth. In 2003, I was there when the North Ridge above Lake McDonald burned. Since then, the remaining dead trees were turning gray and drying out and just waiting to burn. In August 2018, the storm brought several lightning strikes and several fires. In the next few days, the wind picked up and the fire quickly grew as I watched from home on the park's webcam. The air quality in Lake McDonald area got very bad, and much of the park was evacuated. Lake McDonald Lodge was closed for the season, and several private historic park buildings were destroyed. Do a YouTube search and you can see just how bad it was. This was the second bad fire year in a row. In 2017, the historic Sperry Chalet was gutted by fire. It was the only lodge in the park that I had never visited but private donations are helping to reconstruct it. When you're out here, you can't help but be humbled by the beauty and the power of nature. It's why I prefer to stay in the park, where you're surrounded by it. And it's easy to forget that, well, destruction is part of the process. It's a part of nature. Only then can things be reborn and start anew. And there's no better place to watch this process than from one of the park lodges. I've been to the park more times than I can count, and I've been to all of these places. But my favorite place to stay is the Swift Current Motor Inn in the Many Glacier area. When I was younger, I preferred the Swift Current cabins, but, but I'm a little too old for that these days. But the setting here is incredible, and my favorite trailheads are just yards away. And by the way, uh, from a practical point of view, the motor inns and cabins tend to be more quiet than the rooms in the lodges. And a good night's sleep is always nice before a long hike. Approximately two-thirds of the reservations will be available up to 60 days prior to the first entry. And for those who aren't very good at planning, one-third will be available just two days before the entry date. And these reservation tickets are not needed for Two Medicine and Many Glacier, and the other areas not accessible from the Sun Road. Those who spend the time and considerable amount of money to come to Glacier, but who could not get one of those reservations, will likely flood to these areas. And there's no doubt that these areas will be even more crowded this year. And daily closures due to overcrowding can be expected. To get an idea of how frequently these areas are closed, check with the park's website in the days and weeks before you come to see closure patterns. By the way, in Many Glacier, road construction delays are expected to add up to 40 minutes to your travel time anyway. There is little doubt in my mind that next year, Reservations will be required for these areas, too. I've made the long, expensive trip to Glacier most of the last 25 years. But in recent years, the traffic and crowds and forest fires convinced me to cancel. And yes, the lack of affordable room rates in the park also is a bit of a problem. So last year, I decided to go to the park in early October. The fall color was incredible. And I found a great little place to stay just a few miles outside the west entrance. Though the parking at Logan Pass and Trail of the Cedars, well, it was hard to come by by about 8 a.m. But the trails and the pullouts along the Sun Road were definitely less crowded than during the summer months. It convinced me that I need to make more off-season visits.
And with this new ticket reservation system, there's likely to be revisions. So if you're going to the park this year, check with the park's website frequently. And when you come, don't forget to bring your reservation ticket for the Sun Road and to print out your reservation if you happen to be staying inside the park or using a boat tour or taking a road bus tour. You will need them at the park entrance on the Going to the Sun Road on either the east or west side from Memorial Day weekend through Labor Day between 6 a.m. and 5 p.m. Please find and click the like button. It's hidden pretty well if you're watching on your big TV. And consider subscribing to help support this channel. And Patreon donations, they're also extremely welcome. There's one more part of the park to talk about, the North Fork. Here you'll find remote trails, beautiful lakes, off-the-grid homesteads, rafting, and surprisingly, a pretty darn good bakery. We're going to head up the North Fork Road towards Pole Bridge, and then beyond to Bowman Lake. You'll have to take a private vehicle to get there. You can get there from outside the park via the North Fork Road, but we're going to head out from the Atcar town site on the western end of Lake McDonald. The 11 miles of the Kaimas Road is surrounded by forests of different ages. A series of fires over the last 20 years are responsible for the diversity of flora and fauna. The well-maintained park road has the highest speed limit in the park, 45 miles an hour. The road ends at a fork in the road, just outside the park. Turn right on the graveled North Fork Road. It roughly follows the contours of the North Fork of the Flathead River. There are a few turnouts along the way. This one has an info sign describing the benefits of a forest fire to the ecosystem. The past fire made it easy to see the river. As this was shot in late August, there was little white water. Local outfitters provide transportation and guide services for what is surely a most memorable trip. After 30 to 40 minutes, you pass a few old homesteads. The area was settled about 100 years ago, and there are still a few folks who stay here year round, though they are well off the grid. Yep, the power lines stop about 20 miles back. Today, there's a few ranches, a hostel, a few cabins, and the main attraction, Pole Bridge Mercantile. It's been a going concern since Bill Adair hand cut the timber fort in 1914. His original house is next door. Today, it's the Northern Lights Saloon. The nearby clearing holds the rustic hostel with both dorm style and private rooms. There are even a few cabins. The kitchen and outhouses are shared. And you can even rent a canoe. Solar panels provide much of the power. A generator provides the rest. The Merck was once a general store. Since 1991, it's been an off-the-grid bakery. All the items are baked fresh on site by a staff that lives on site. Of course, t-shirts and other souvenirs are available. The place has changed little and the handcrafted construction is on display. It stood up well against over 100 years of harsh weather. It's open year round, but in winter, only three days a week. The road to Bowman heads north, past the saloon. Back in the day, this was a residential street. Most of the home sites are long gone, but you can see evidence of the old buildings along with past forest fires. About a mile later, the road turns right to cross a bridge over the North Fork River. Almost immediately, there's a ranger station, indicating we're about to re-enter the park. From there, the park road gets rougher. A couple of yards after the park gate, there's another fork in the road. Go to the left for 14 miles, and you'll end up at the beautiful Kitla Lake. We're going to go to the right, and in six miles, we'll be at the equally nice Bowman Lake. The single lane track is twisty with many blind corners. We're going only about 15 to 20 miles an hour. As a precaution, I honk the horn on particularly blind corners to alert anyone heading in the opposite direction. Once you're at the Bowman Lake parking lot, which also, by the way, fills up often, there are several trails to choose from including the 12.8 mile loop to three hikes, including the picturesque Quartz Lake. Around here, the trails spend a lot of time in trees. Into Quartz Lake, it goes up and down over 2,500 feet. So you'll need to be in shape to enjoy the remoteness of this trail. From Bowman Lake, there's another hike that's even higher. You can hike up 3,000 feet to Numa Lookout. 
This trail is 11.2 miles out and back, but it provides a great view of the area. There's also a more moderate hike to Akokaala Lake, if that's how you pronounce it. It's only 11.6 very remote miles, and it goes up just 1,500 feet. So if you like the remoteness, that one might be for you. The last lake in this area is Kintla Lake. The road from Pole Bridge to Kintla Lake is another rough one. It'll take about 40 minutes to travel just 15.7 miles. But this is another beautiful lake. The trail follows the shoreline, and it's basically flat. I ran into a big pile of bear scat once I got here, and, well, frankly, I turned back. Took it as a bad omen. Others take it 29 miles all the way to Goat Haunt, camping along the way. Goat Haunt is at the southern end of Waterton Lake, and most people don't hike there. It's about a four-hour drive from Apgar. There is a border crossing, and by the way, you're not allowed to bring most bear spray into Canada. I learned this the hard way. And there is a fee to enter Waterton Lakes National Park. The best photo op in Waterton just might be this one. This is the park's Prince of Wales Hotel in a magnificent setting. Goat Haunt is a remote outpost that may be unmanned due to budget cuts. It's located back in the U.S. on the other side of the lake, so you'll have to take a boat to get there. And it's not free. This is where the Continental Divide Trail ends. But there are also some shortish trails here, and they don't have a lot of up. But remember, you need to finish them in time to get back to take the last boat back to Waterton. So let's review the North Fork area. It's pretty remote. It's not very visited. There's not a lot of parking here either. To get to the lakes, you're going to have to go through narrow gravel roads that are a bit rough. So campers and trailers are not recommended. The trails here are generally pretty flat around the lake, and it's the lowest altitude in the park. But if you want to go up and see the lakes from above, well, the North Fork area can take care of that for you too. Glacier has a companion park north of the border. This park feels European. The first thing you see when you drive in is the Swiss-style Prince of Wales Hotel and its incredible Upper Waterton Lake backdrop. If you're ever in the mood for an afternoon high tea, check out its lobby. There are several trails in the area, but the Parks Canada website makes it hard to find out where they are. The first page has info about Banff and other parks, but you have to click the Things to Do page and scroll down past locations of places to sit to the All Activities list. Then with the help of reading glasses, look under the Dog Walking link to find the hiking link. It's here that you'll find the only map, and this is it. It's useless. There are a few more links further down. There is a list of short hikes with descriptions, but it's amazing how little information there is for such a great hiking area. National Geographic recently named a day hike here one of the most thrilling, thrilling hikes, hikes in the world. world. And where do you find info about it? It's under day hikes where it can easily be lost amongst all the others. Oh, here it is, Crypt Lake. Come on, Canada, step it up a bit. Canada's parks are profit centers and there's not much money in hiking. Luckily, the large U.S. Glacier PDF map includes many trails in Waterton Lakes, including the thrilling oh, really, really. Crypt Lake Trail. Sadly, I haven't done it, because years ago I was told not to hike it alone, so I kind of forgot about it. But now it's so popular, that's not a problem. The Crypt Lake Trail is not for everyone. It's a bit rugged, steep, and potentially dangerous. There's even a tiny tunnel. In other words, it's wonderful. But since its recent designation, it's also often crowded. It's 10.8 miles long, and it goes up 2,300 feet. The trailhead is at the midpoint of Upper Waterton Lake. You get there by boat. The Waterton Town site is quaint, with plenty of places to spend your money. And there's also a small harbor, where the Waterton Shoreline Cruise Company is based. I've taken one of their cruises, and, and I even saw a bear from the boat. Today, a big part of their business is taking hikers to the Crypt Lake Trailhead. Obviously, space is limited, so you might want to get your tickets in advance and hope that you picked a good weather day. If you're a fast hiker, you might want to put some space between you and the crowd in the first four and a half miles. After that, you'll be single file. 
A half mile past an old campground, the trail goes up a narrow ledge and ends at a sheer cliff. On the way, check out the 600 foot waterfall. When it gets really tricky, there's a welcome handrail. At the cliff face, an eight foot step ladder provides access to a 60 foot natural tunnel that's too small to stand up in. This is a popular selfie spot, so there might be a bit of a delay here. Then there's a stroll down to the lake. And this is Crip Lake. It's a pleasant place to rest after this amazing crossing, while thinking about how lucky you are to be able to hike back on this thrilling trail, 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 trail. one more time. So how do you get here? Well, Waterton Lakes is about an hour's drive from St. Mary via the Chief Mountain Highway. That means it's three to four hours from Apgar on the west side. The border crossing is not open 24 hours a day, so late night crossings require an even longer drive. And the road is closed in winter. Yes, Glacier's Companion Park is a bit out of the way. But if you have the time, it's well worth a trip, even if you don't do one of the most thrilling hikes, hikes in, in the world. world. But if you do do the trail, Keep in mind that this level of activity is not for everyone. You need to be in good shape before you get here. Medical services are quite limited, and you're at least a couple of hours away from a major hospital. And also remember that this park belongs to nature. We are the intruding visitors. You can't do a video about this park without talking about glaciers. And believe me, I wish you could. The issue generates lots of hateful comments from those on both sides of the issue. So this time I'm not going to mention Milankovitch cycles, ice core CO2 data, or interglacial periods. I'm just going to say that when the Little Ice Age ended in the 1850s, there were about 150 glaciers in the park. Today, there are 26. I've been going to the park since 1994, and I've seen the changes. On my second trip in 1995, the ice on Grinnell Glacier was thick enough to form an ice cave. That's no longer the case. In 1997, I hiked up to Grinnell Glacier with Al Gore's group. I spent a few hours chatting with the environmental advisors of both Gore and Clinton. By 2005, there were only 27 glaciers left. And the experts? Well, they decided all the glaciers in the park would be gone by 2020. The park put up info signs to let everyone know. The national media told the world. And the publicity, well, it helped increase visitation by 50%. By 2011, the park was down to just 25 glaciers. And the expert predictions seemed to be right. But Mother Nature knows more than experts. The glaciers inconveniently survived 2020. And the glacier count is now 26. Yep. The park gained one back. One of the great things about the park website is it has great historical photo. This was Grinnell Glacier back in the day. And here it is today. When it receded, it revealed more evidence of our changing world. These are stromatolite fossils. They are 1.4 billion years old, if you believe the science. And if you believe the world is only 6,000 years old, please don't write hateful comments. Anyway, these cabbage-shaped fossils were built by cyanobacteria, which is a blue-green algae. They formed in shallow tropical seas, when the continent was much nearer the equator, which means this mountaintop was once a tropical beach. When these formed, they were the most sophisticated and dominant species on Earth. They took advantage of the Earth's atmosphere, which was rich in CO2 and had very little free oxygen. These creatures changed that. They consumed the CO2 in great numbers, and their waste gas, their pollution, was actually oxygen. And they polluted the environment with a gas that was toxic to them to such an extent that they were no longer the dominant species. But that enabled more complex creatures to develop. Getting back to the glaciers. Yes, in the last 150 years, they have been receding. But for the foreseeable future, you'll be able to see several of them and even hike to one in Glacier National Park. Thank you for watching. 
even a video this long can't cover the whole park. That's why I've made several other videos on the park. The 50 Hikes in Glacier video? Well, it's a great resource for repeat visitors. And my What to Know Before You Go video is great for first-timers. I try to make my channel a resource for outdoor lovers, so hit the subscribe button and check back often, because I make new content to help keep my subscribers up to date. Thanks again, and don't forget to hit that like button.